Okay, I think you know, Rob, Rob, you gave quite a bit of the, uh, of the context, uh, probably at quite a high level. What I'll do is try to bring it down into maybe a little more specific, some of the numbers. Uh, so the first slide that I have, and it just helps to go through some of the technical challenges that, uh, that we face around the safety. I think he, Robbie spoke at a high level, but what you'll see here is in red, we are making significant improvement in the fatality frequency. It's just when we look at it, it's not at the rate that we would like. And when we extend it out and thinking about going to five kilometers, we don't see making the kind of change that we, that we need to make on, on the fatality frequency. And really, what's underpinning the fatality frequency and our safety performance is, is really the way we mine. And the next slide also goes in and shows that not only is it safety as we think about it in terms of fatality frequency, it's also significant in terms of the health. So there's three issues. One is the heat, the silica dust, and the noise. And again, it's the way we're, we're mining with the people inside the stope, which is driving those three issues. And we're not going to make a significant improvement in those unless we bring new technology and new thinking and new mine designs to our operations. Next slide. Uh, the second aspect of sort of the context, and Robbie spoke about it, is the, is the cost. What you'll see over the last seven years is that in the, in the top left corner, the blue, that the gold production has had a steady decline out of the South African region. However, the cost base has, has remained constant. So if you look at the top right, what's happened to our unit cost is our unit cost has risen dramatically. And it's not, and it's not sustainable. The next slide. What you see here is our six operations. And really, you'll see, as he talked about it, the Moab Katsong and the Mpaneng mine are the only two mines that, that really make any money. The other four are basically break even. So, you know, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but what it's trying to illustrate is we looked out into the future and said at some point we're just going to end up into a break-even situation. We have it there saying it's 2012. It might be 2013. It might be 2014. But if we don't change something, there is going to be a time soon, very soon, where we really won't be making any money. And in terms of large capital investment to go to five kilometers, it will be very difficult to get the money to continue to invest in the operations when people will be looking at graphs saying that you're going to be break even. So that sort of sets, for me, the, the context about what's urgent uh, and what needs to be addressed with, with some of the specifics. Now, the other thing is, so what are the opportunities? Here's what Robbie was talking about. You'll see in the, in the red box uh, on, the, on the right side is the Anglo Gold South African region. A hundred million ounces of gold is in reserves, or in resource. And what we're saying is that there's probably a third of that that right now we can, con we can convert with the known mining practices that we can convert to reserves. So, so there's 70 million ounces out there. If we can change our thinking, that we could tap into. Quite significant. That's just uh, AGA. The, the, if we crack this formula, it will spread pretty fast all across South Africa and probably into the world. And so that, that number, if you, if you looked at it across the entire industry, is probably 10 times that size. Next slide. So, you know, I think Robbie was touching on this point too, and, and really, mines run the way they're designed. And really, the way they're designed is underpinned by the technology that you're applying. So, you know, I was speaking with, with Sean the other day and saying, you know, coming in with a fresh pair of eyes, you know, which is, you know, quite helpful. It's, it's some of it you're, you're having a difficult time understanding what you're looking at, but other things are, are really stand out. So, one of the things that stood out for me. When I, when I go around our operations here in South Africa, is that the infrastructure on surface is world class. Some of the best shafts I have ever seen, you look at the surface facilities, they're world class. There's not much I could add when I look at that. However, you go underground and you start to, I call it, you start to march to the face. I feel like I'm marching down into the past. And every step I go closer and closer and closer and closer to the stope, I feel like I'm going back in time until finally I get to the stope and I feel like I am at the beginning of mining, as, you know, sort of 100 years ago. That's where I feel that, that I am. And so you know, that's a huge opportunity for us to say, OK, so how do we, how do we march to the, to the future? And I, and I think that when we, when we look at it, if we want to make a significant change in our performance of our minds, we have, to, we have to go and look at the design. And if we're going to look at the design, what's underpinning that is a rethink of the technology. Which is, you know, I think it's, I'm sort of reiterating what everybody says. But for me, when I put it in that kind of logic, in my mind, it makes it perfectly clear that we must go to the technology first. We must go there, because that's what underpins everything that we, we do in a mine. And again, the goals that we're chasing, 
we, it's urgent that we get our head around what it takes to change the mind so that we can stand up legitimately and say we are going to eliminate fatalities. That's urgent. That's urgent business. And the other one is to make the step change in the cost structure that will allow us to create the future. And the final statement there is sort of really, I guess it sort of encapsulates, you know, I think everybody's thinking inside our company is that what we, what we have been doing will not work at five kilometers. I mean, I think that's really the fundamental bottom line. People just do not believe it will work. And so we've got this window, probably five years to come up with the, with the thinking of, of what we want to do and probably five years to, to implement it. You know, so there you, know, you, you look at the, uh, you know, the big breakthroughs required, very hostile environment. Everybody's familiar with that. Extremely complex. When you look at the, the, the logistics of what we're doing and the shaft time and the amount of material and everything that we bring down, it's a very, very complex environment. And so what we're looking for is a step change, and again, reiterated is in safety, and I think uh, Robbie was talking about also in, in labor productivity. That is really what is driving our, our costs up. The, the, the rise in the cost of labor uh, has been significant, and there's no stopping that. That is going to continue to rise. And he, he mentioned about uh, where I came from in Sudbury. If you, if you go back and look at what was going on there, that was exactly the same thing. In 1970 or 1969, 1970, people were being paid $2 an hour. I don't know if that resonates with anybody <laughs> here. And today, all up, people in that operation are being paid $60 an hour, $30 in wages and $30 in, in benefits. And so there, there was no way without a, without a dramatic improvement in, in labor productivity underpinned by a new technology, those operations would never have survived. And so the, the leaders at the time put a, put a stake in the ground and said, we are going to change everything. And they did. They were doing cut and fill in stoke mining. Safety performance was completely unacceptable. The cost was unacceptable. The, you know, what we were doing from a health point of view to people was unacceptable. And the leaders you know, put that stake in the ground and changed everything. And it created, it created the future that, uh, that Sudbury has, has today. I believe the same thing, same thing is going to happen here. So you know, why, why a technology or why a consortium approach? And, and I think it comes right down to what Robbie was talking about, the time that uh, if you look at it over the last, say, 30 years, probably 20 to 30 years mining companies, and I think uh, AGA is the same, we, we took our research that we were doing in-house and we gave it to our suppliers because we were happy with the mining paradigm that we were working with. And what we said was that the, the suppliers were much better at doing R&D than we were and that we would adopt it. There'd be some interaction and we would adopt it. But when you want to actually change the whole paradigm, all of a sudden it's a, it's a big change. That, that going down that same path won't work. And so what we're saying is we need a complete change and there's no way that we have the in-house resources to tackle this problem alone. We will not succeed in the time that is required. So you know, if we went and built up a whole research lab facilities and you know, manned it up with people and, and ground away at the problem, it'd probably take us 20 years. We've got five. So that's why we had to go to a wider community. And that's what this picture on the left is really, is really a, a depiction of, of what it is we're doing. We're bringing in people from sort of all walks of, of, uh, of life, so to speak, to help us understand the, the problem and look at new and novel ways. Because if we, if we keep it confined, confined to, to AGA, we're likely to come up with the same. If we confine it to the mining industry, yeah, we might get something different. But we're, we think for the, for the magnitude of change, we need to step outside the industry and, and look for people to come and contribute and help. And, and so with that approach, with the, sorry, if you go back to what we believe that this approach will bring, it will bring, it will bring speed and it'll bring in, it brings a proven track record. That's, that's really what's underpinning it. And the diversity is sort of the, the genetic gene pool that we're, that we're working with. So what's in it for consortium members? You know, obviously you get a chance to work on one of the most difficult problems in the mining industry worldwide. It's right here in South Africa. And you know, I think everybody knows that. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to work with us to be part of cracking probably the most difficult problem in the industry. And, and, when, you know, and as we come up with, with a new ways of working and a new paradigm, you know, as team members, you, know, you'll, you, you potentially have the opportunity to gain a competitive advantage you know, in the mining industry worldwide because, you know, what we come up with, while we'll be able to use it, you know, in-house, there's no doubt that it'll have application much broader than, than our company. 
And so there's a final, I think there's a final slide here. This uh, sort of just in my head, you know, tells us, gives us an, a, a thinking about how we're going about this. So this, this bottom uh, little drawing just shows the open innovation model where it's basically saying you're not looking in-house, you're looking outside for ideas. Some ideas we'll, we'll be able to just take from other industries and just say the, the solution from another industry, we can, just, we can just hitchhike that and take it right into our business. So that's what that open innovation. The core competencies, we borrowed this slide from, uh, from uh, 3M. I thought it was a, was a fantastic uh, picture for me that says, you know, underpinning your, your business model is your technology. And underpinning the technology are you really your core competencies. And so you have to focus on your core competencies, understand what they are, and look to broaden them and deepen them. And then as you, as you become more skilled with your core competencies, it will actually help you on your bottom line, bringing, you know, producing saleable products. So, so while we're changing our technology, we want to be always aware as we change, what are the new core competencies, technical core competencies that underpin the new model so that we can be declarative about what they are and build up things like knowledge hubs where, we, where we'll broaden and deepen our understanding to help us with the bottom line. And the final picture up at the top, the leadership practices, it's obvious that this process is not gonna, is not gonna manage itself, that there is leadership accountabilities to make this happen, and so that's just a, a little picture to say these are the three components that we're bringing together to try to help you know, produce this, this breakthrough in, in the mining that we're looking for. That's the last slide I, I have. Uh, and so I, I probably have time to maybe field one or two questions if, if anybody has anything that's top of mind. Okay, I might turn it over to, to Robbie. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so the first slide that I have, and it just helps to go through some of the technical challenges that, uh, that we face around the safety. I think he, Robbie spoke at a high level, but what you'll see here is in red, we are making significant improvement in the fatality frequency. It's just when we look at it, it's not at the rate that we would like. And when we extend it out and thinking about going to five kilometers, we don't see making the kind of change that we, that we need to make on, on the fatality frequency. And really, what's underpinning the fatality frequency and our safety performance is, is really the way we mine. Uh, the second aspect of sort of the context, and Robbie spoke about it, is the, is the cost. What you'll see over the last seven years is that in the, in the top left corner, the blue, that the gold production has had a steady decline out of the South African region. However, the cost base has, has remained constant. So if you look at the top right, what's happened to our unit cost is our unit cost has risen dramatically. And it's not, and it's not sustainable. So, you know, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but what it's trying to illustrate looked out into the future and said at some point, we're just going to end up into a break-even situation. We have it there saying it's 2012. It might be 2013, it might be 2014, but if we don't change something, there is going to be a time soon, very soon, where we really won't be making any money. So that sort of sets, for me, the, the context about what's urgent uh, and what needs to be addressed with, with some of the specifics. Now, the other thing is, so what are the opportunities? Here's what Robbie was talking about. You'll see in the, in the red box uh, on, the, on the right side is the Anglo Gold South African region. A hundred million ounces of gold is in reserves or in resource, and what we're saying is that there's probably a third of that that right now we can, con we can convert with the known mining practices that we can convert to reserves. So, so there's 70 million ounces out there. If we can change our thinking, that we could tap into. Quite significant. That's just uh, AGA. The, the, if we crack this formula, it will spread pretty fast all across South Africa and probably into the world. And so that, that number, if you, if you looked at it across the entire industry, is probably 10 times that size. One of the things that stood out for me when I, when I go around our operations here in South Africa is that the infrastructure on surface is world class. Some of the best shafts I have ever seen, you look at the surface facilities, they're world class. There's not much I could add when I look at that. However, you go underground and you start to, I call it, you start to march to the face. I feel like I'm marching down into the past. And every step I go closer and closer and closer and closer to the stope, I feel like I'm going back in time until finally I get to the stope and I feel like I am at the beginning of mining, as, you know, sort of a hundred years ago. That's where I feel that, that I am. And so, you know, that's a huge opportunity for us to say, okay, so how do we, how do we march to the, to the future? 
And I, and I think that when we, when we look at it, if we want to make a significant change in our performance of our minds, we have, to, we have to go and look at the design. And if we're going to look at the design, what's underpinning that is a rethink of the technology. Which is, you know, I think it's, I'm sort of reiterating what everybody says, but for me, when I put it in that kind of logic, in my mind, it makes it perfectly clear that we must go to the technology first. We must go there, because that's what underpins everything that we, we do in the mind. And again, the goals that we're chasing, we, it's urgent that we get our head around what it takes to change the mind so that we can stand up legitimately and say, we are going to eliminate fatalities. That's urgent. That's urgent business. And the other one is to make the step change in the cost structure that will allow us to create the future. And the final statement there is sort of really, I guess it sort of encapsulates, you know, I think everybody's thinking inside our company is that what we've been doing will not work at five kilometers. I mean, I think that's really the fundamental bottom line. People just do not believe it will work. And so we've got this window, probably five years to come up with the, with the thinking of, of what we want to do and probably five years to, to implement it.